recorded properly. All right. Like I said, this is going to be recorded. And one thing I say at the beginning of all of these, if you're not very familiar with the strategy or uh, I've never tried to defend one of these types of strategies the way we're going to be talking about it, I would highly recommend you guys, once you get this uh, email sent or this sent to you in an email or whatever, to watch it over again, you guys, so that it really uh, solidifies into your memory. First time through, it's a lot of things are going to blow by you. Uh, and you won't remember it very long. If you watch it again, all of that stuff sinks into your long-term memory and you will be much better off for having done that. Uh, because if it goes down the road and you go to try and think about how this all was put together, uh, you're gonna rewatch it and kind of have to learn it all again. Whereas if you rewatch it right away, it sticks a lot better, believe me. So this is the third part in the three-part series of, of great option strategies. We did the one on the iron condor a couple of weeks ago. Last week we did one on an iron butterfly. And this week we're gonna be talking about how you defend those two strategies when and if they go against you. But a few things we gotta go over, get out of the way. My name's Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or the Wall Street Journal for my commentary on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis been trading my own money for over 20 years now. I'm not here to tell you that I'm going to make you rich or that I'm going to make you a millionaire, but I am here to help you take control of your finances, manage your own portfolio, and most importantly, take control of your own risk. You guys, this is really important for you guys to get into this and learn this yourself. Take control of your finances because at the end of the day, all the fees you're paying to a financial advisor or a mutual fund and whatnot, those things are going to, uh, it's not value added. Taking control of your finances by taking these classes is value added and it will show up in your PL at the end of the day. A couple of people are asking, this is being recorded, yes, and please watch it again at the end. Um, so uh, make sure you go and uh, Rewatch this again shortly after watching it this first time so you guys remember it a little better. All right, uh, moving on. Traded in most markets throughout my career from the Chicago Board of Trade. I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodity futures, currencies, and options on all of these products in all market conditions. As you can see, that is one of the crazier days. If you want to uh, hear the prior webinars, go to ProTraderStrategies.com and uh and or you can call i'll show the links at the end of the day or at the end of the presentation for those uh disclaimer i got to go over any opinions news research and analysis and other information contained here or provided by pro trader strategies and associate companies employees is to be general commentary does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities that we're talking about or strategies. The reason why I can't give you a strategy that you should put into your portfolio or an underlying that you need to put into your portfolio is because I don't know what's already in your guys' portfolios and I don't know your risk parameters. You know, one thing that I would have to struggle with is that I have a high risk tolerance. So for you guys to know what your risk tolerance is, I would have to sit down with you, look at your portfolio, see uh, how you would react to certain situations given uh, a move in the underlying and things of that nature to find that all out. So the bottom line is we're here to teach you guys how to swim, not necessarily to swim for you. And remember to do your own homework. Please remember that past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. Now that we got all that out of the way, let's get this on. Like I said, this is defending the iron condor and the iron butterfly. Now, when we put these strategies on, I told you guys about the probabilities of uh, them being successful for the um, iron condor. For instance, we were looking about a 67% uh, probability of success and a 33% uh, probability of it not working out. So that would say that one in three of those would not necessarily work out. Well, we did have one of our three not work out and I'll go over that in a little bit, but two of them did. Um, 
and that that works right with the probabilities. Now, one thing we have to remember going forward with this is that our probabilities of being in the money at expiration are half of the probabilities of us being tested during the duration of that trade. So if our probability of being out of the money and having this be a winner is uh, say 33% probability of success, there's a 66% probability that we are going to be tested on that. That's the way the math works out. You have twice as much probability or, um, you know, if you sold a 16 Delta option, your probability of being tested on that is 30. If you uh, did a 36 uh, Delta option, your probability of being tested is almost 70%. So, you got to let the probabilities play out. It's kind of like when you're, uh, you know, playing the probabilities at, at uh, blackjack or something like that. The probabilities are the probabilities, and you have to, uh, you have to play those probabilities and let them work out. So you might be extending duration or uh, defending it in a sense. All right. So the iron condor and the iron butterfly, we're looking for a range bound or market neutral type of strategy when we're implementing this. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's the mindset behind this. So as long as your mindset is the same, then you want to go into steps to defend this. And I'm going to go over how you defend the iron condor and the iron butterfly uh, separately. They're almost the same, but there's a few little nuances to the iron butterfly that is a little bit different than the iron condor. Uh, with the iron condor, we are going to roll the untested side when our break even is tested. So, for instance, when we put on these strategies, um, if I am doing a $1 wide iron condor, for instance, um, say, for instance, we put on the Walmart uh, March 61, 62 put spread and combine that with the 68, 69 put spread. Okay. We collected 30 cents for that slightly less than a third, the width of those strikes, which would be 33 cents. Right. But, um, for all intents and purposes, it's between that 25 and 30 or, uh, 25 and a third, the width of the strike or sorry, a quarter and the third, the width of the strike, I'm sorry, 25 cents to 33 cents that we're looking for when we're doing this strategy. Um, so for instance, if we did the 68, 69 uh, on the call side, when it started, the underlying started trading at 68, 30, that's when we're gonna be looking to defend the iron condor. So you add what your credit is to the call side and that is where your break even is. To the put side, we did the 61, 62 put spread so we're short the 62s. So when that underlying trades at $61.70, that's when we would look to roll down those calls. Does that make sense to everybody so far? I know it's a, a little bit difficult when we're uh, kind of talking through it with air, but um, I'll show you on the platform also when that stuff comes together. But so with the big takeaway here is we roll the untested side when our break even is tested. Okay. And we're rolling that untested side to the, like the 30 ish Delta. Now it depends on, um, what you foresee. Did you see this as a slight blip? You know, you're going to have to take a little bit of your own gut feeling on this. You know, if it is, you're feeling like, Hey, yeah, I'm just getting tested on this upside. I'm going to play out the probabilities. You might not do anything. But if you're a little bit worried about this not coming back, maybe it broke through a Fibonacci level or something like that, uh, depending on how you set up your trades, then you might want to get a little bit more aggressive and go to like the 36 Delta. That's why I have 30 ish Delta. I find that the 30 deltas are the ones that I really look at. That's the, giving me the best bang for my buck on the roll. Um, uh, asking how you, calculate the break even you take what your credit is and add it to the short call that is your break even to the upside or you take that credit received and subtract it from your short put uh, 
that is your break evens. The reason why you can add that credit to both sides is because you can't be tested or you can't have it be in the money on the calls or in the money on the puts at any given time. One of those is going to expire worthless, right? So, and that's why we can roll that untested side because a lot of times when we're being tested on our, say, puts, those calls are pretty much worthless anymore. They're not really going to help us anymore. So the reason why we roll that down, collect some more credit, and hope that we can get some decay in those, and we increase our break even by doing that. And I'll talk about that because we did that in ADM, which was one of our strategies. Okay, so, and then we can roll out in time to extend duration. Now, never do this for a debit. You don't want to add more risk to this strategy by rolling it out for duration if you aren't going to be able to collect a credit. And a lot of times you won't necessarily be able to collect a good credit for it. So it's kind of like you're going to roll it um, and collect a little more premium. You can also do this again with this strategy and roll down to where the long call and the long or sorry, the short call and the short put would be uh, building an iron butterfly in a sense. So let's look at a, uh, this was on the ADM. So this was our ADM trade and I had collected um, 28 cents for this. So it was just slightly better than the dollar width. So what we originally had done in this strategy is sold the 35 36 or 35 and a half, 36 and a half call spread and the 30, 31 put spread. Sold the 31s, bought the 30s for protection. And I collected a total um, on this strategy for ADM originally for 28 cents. Okay, so my break even, you had that 28 cents to the calls and that put it at $35.78. As you can tell here, the last trade was $35.78. That's when I decide, all right, um, with this one, I didn't think it was necessarily going to come back. So that felt like to me the optimal time to roll this. So I uh, sold these 30 puts, bought these 31 puts back in, and at the same time, one click, basically creating a uh, butterfly in a sense, um, then went to sell the uh, the 34, 35 put spread. So the, I don't know why that highlighted. It must have been where I left my cursor, but I did the 35, 34 put spread and was able to collect, after I rolled those down, I collected another 22 cents for that trade, okay? So that increased my break even from 35, uh, 35.50 to $36. So it's basically, you know, I, I lowered my risk from being 72 cents to only 50 cents if it doesn't come back. Does that make sense? And if it comes back and lands here right at the, between the 35 and a half and the 35, and then I collect all that 50 cents. Otherwise, I decrease my risk. Now, uh, ADM has gone to rally on and it is looking like it is a full loser. Um, one thing you could do is roll this again. I'm probably not going to get that much credit and you create the iron butterfly. So that is another option, especially if you're using larger uh, value, maybe $100 stocks like Netflix or something like that. You might be able to roll this one or two times and keep collecting credit until you build out the iron butterfly and then you can hope that it comes back in pins right there. Does that make sense? All right, good. So you can constantly roll these down all the way to where it creates an iron butterfly, which is selling the straddle with defined risk and keep collecting credits for that. Now onto the iron butterfly defending it. We're gonna roll though when our defined risk side, which is our long call or our long put is tested. So you're taking on a little bit more risk when you're doing this, but remember the probabilities are for this butterfly to come back. And we're only trying to collect about a 25% our initial credit received. So 
we're just looking for this to come in for a second and have that volatility can collapse on us and click that premium rather quickly. So there are some things to do, but a lot of times with the iron butterfly, I'm going to let the probabilities play out. But if you want to get defensive, and I do this also, when, especially when my mindset around this underlying changes, is you roll the untested side. So you're going to roll when our long call or our long put is tested, and you're going to roll the untested side to the short strike that is the 30 delta. So that's where it's it's the same. We're still looking for that 30 delta. We're actually going inverted here, you guys, uh, with the iron butterfly. It is when you have um, this strategy going against you. You're trying to uh, cauterize the bleeding, if you will, um, because the strategy has gone against you. You're losing money, so you're going to uh, go inverted. And the way we build this butterfly, Cindy, is – you're selling a strat, uh, you're selling the straddle. So you're selling the at the money straddle. And then your uh, whatever your credit you collect for that straddle, say it's five dollars, then you would make your wings ten dollars wide. So if we did the you know uh, the hundred strike and for that straddle, which is a hundred short call, hundred short put, we collect $5, we would move our wings out $10. So it gives you a probability of success of 50-50. So, uh, you know, with those probabilities, you got to remember that probability of success is also almost 100% that you're going to be tested at some point. So that's why uh, I like to let this play out to the wings because the probabilities are that I'm going to be tested. So I have to play those probabilities. Um, but if it starts really pushing higher, then we want to roll that untested side, get inverted and go to the 30 ish Delta. Now, you know, you're, uh, basically locking in a loss on this, but you're trying to lock in less of a loss than what you would have normally felt. And then we can roll out and, or we can roll out. To extend duration to let this whole thing play out again um, when you've rolled to the 30 delta and gone inverted it doesn't work very well but if you're letting it play out then roll for duration make sure you're collecting a credit to increase those break-evens okay so the rolling to extend for duration is really in and of itself separate from the first two because you haven't rolled usually when you roll you're not going to be able to get much of an extra credit when you do that roll for duration. All right, so let's get into the platform and talk about a couple of things here. So um, this is the spy uh, broken wing butter or the spy uh, iron butterfly that we did. But let's go to uh, the Walmart we qu we closed, and I still have some Walmart in the April. And as you can see, it's it's not really tested yet but uh, these strategies take a long time to uh, start decaying and then they decay rather quickly like uh, if you remember I did the March 61 62 68 69 iron uh, condor so the 61 62s were the puts the 68 69s were the calls short the 62s short the 68s and then we did a credit of 30 cents. Now we covered that for 15 cents uh, and made 50% of our max profit. Then we also did that in XOM, Exxon Mobil. And XOM actually almost got our um, Aprils out of the way, XOM. So, the, so these... You know, Exxon Mobil, if you look at the chart, has done everything we want it to do. It's traded right along, bouncing back and forth since we put this on uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we've also gotten that volatility to really contract. As you can see down here, the volatility just continued to go down. That's exactly what we want from an iron condor. You pin it on the inside and the outside. And with this particular uh, XOM trade, we uh, have on the... 70 
two and a half, 75 and a, or 72 and a half, 75 and a half put spread with the uh, 90, 92 and a half uh, call spread there. So we, you know, and on these, you guys remember, we did this webinar on a Friday. I had to wait until Monday to put a lot of these trades on. So I wasn't getting uh, a third the width of my strike, for instance, with this XOM trade. I was only able to get 56 cents for it. Uh, I should have been trying to get around uh, 70 some odd cents for that. All right. Uh, but I did it just because, you know, I was thinking one of these would get tested before I had to take it off. But I was almost uh, able to take this off today for um, I think I could have gotten out of it for 30 cents or something, but uh, something along those lines. So when I say uh, I'm getting a question here, so when you say roll the long call or the put, are you selling the long call or the put and moving to the 30 ish delta? in the same expiration. Yes. So for instance, um, <clears throat> with that ADM, you know, I rolled, you're rolling both the, the short call or short put and the short call, for instance, with ADM because the ADM, we rolled it and here it is now. So, you know, when I took that snapshot of when I rolled it, it was trading right in between here. Now it's at a max loss because it's, you know, gone well above. You know, I'm hoping that it's going to come back down here and trade somewhere between the 35 and a half and 35 ish area. And that way I would be able to collect my full 50 cents. That's the 28 cents from the original strategy that had the 30. 31 put spread. We rolled the 30, 31 put spread to the 30 ish delta at the time, which was the 35, 34 uh, delta strategy. So, for instance, it was right here. So we were trading, you know, and it had actually come off a little bit after I had done that strategy, but I'd done that roll, but it was like around 36 when I rolled this. This delta was around 36 because the market was a little bit higher. So I'm rolling the entire spread. I don't want to increase my risk. Uh, I'm trying to lower my risk by doing this, by collecting more credit here. Does that make sense? So it is in the same expiration cycle. If you know we continue to be where we are now, you know, and I was still bearish or thinking ADM was overbought or something like that. That's when I'm going to roll this for uh, duration. That would be my next step if it continued to be up here. I'd try and roll, collect a credit. I'm not going to roll it to collect a debit because that starts increasing your risk again, right? Because I'm lowering my break even. I'm adding more risk to this trade. If it's gone bad, then I'm probably just going to cut my losses. If I can get a credit for it, yes, I'm going to try and roll it for duration to the April. Does that make sense to everybody so far? So that's that's why we rolled that to defend it because I took my risk from, and if I would waited till after it's blown through there, you know, now I'm forced to go inverted to get any type of credit, but I was able to get 22 cents and that increased my uh break even by 22 cents, which makes it my break even is right at $36. The original strikes for the ADM were still these, the 35 and the 36, uh, sorry, the 35 and a half, 36 and a half calls. And my original puts were the 31 puts I was short and I was long the 30 puts. And for that, full iron condor, I collected 28 cents for it. So right there at a third the width, third the width means there's $1 wide. I collected 28 cents. So that's pretty close to a third. I talk, I talk about this, that uh, on these strategies, I'm trying to collect somewhere between 25% and 30% the width of those strikes, just so that my probabilities of success are, you know, 65 to 75% probability of success success. If there was a debit on the 
roll, I would just, yes, I would close it. I'd actually probably let it expire because I'm not going to really get assigned when I have the defined risk if it's way above. So it's not going to, they're going to cancel each other out. I'm not going to worry about that. I mean, why pay the commissions necessarily? <clears throat> um, you know, but I might close out the, the put side if it got really close to this. And at the end of the day, this market was way up here. I might just close these out if I close them out, which I'm pretty close to doing it for less than a nickel. You know, uh, with 14 days to go, I might just close out this if I can do it for less than five cents, because if I close it out for five cents, remember, then my break even is no longer thirty six dollars. It's actually thirty five ninety five because I've added a little risk to that strategy. But for that nickel, I don't want to see these start, you know, inflate either so at less than a nickel that would be the only time i would look to maybe leg out of this strategy you know if we were trading up here at 39 or something like that um i might just say you know what i'm going to cover these calls because all that at this point they can do is hurt me if they're only trading a nickel i can't get any more out of them necessarily uh then i might just cover those and let this ride Uh, I'm being asked what my favorite stock is for iron condors. Uh, I don't really have a favorite stock for iron condors. I have a tendency to look at something that's had uh, a lot of big moves. Like I saw this as being a jumping beam. We came down, boom, and I thought we were going to kind of settle down a little here. Uh, ADM has taken a nice big pop that was a little unexpected. I thought it would at least, you know, we had come down, bounce. I thought it would just kind of trend a little sideways. So it was just kind of um, an idea that I had come up with that, you know, you have a big move, you have a rebound, and then the bounces start getting small for at least a short period of time. And then, um, you know, make a move. But I thought we would be out of that ADM by that time. Whereas something like Walmart um, has, has done that, you know, it's had those big moves, had the earnings, and then now it's settling down. So that's why we got that big move. We had the vol at really high highs. When we put that on, it started coming off and the vol contraction is really what we're looking for for the iron condor more than we're looking for um, something that always trades in a range something always trades sideways like utilities and stuff like that. They just don't get the high implied volatility. So what I'm looking for is a big spike in implied volatility, not necessarily because of earnings, but for some other reason, and then have the market settle down afterwards and the volatility re reverts the mean, the underlying settles down for at least a week or two. And that's how you get that happening. And I want IV for condors to be above 50%. Yes, which this is the 50% indicator here or IV percent over here. So I want anytime I'm selling or collecting a premium for any strategy whatsoever, I'm looking for high implied volatility because I want that contraction to happen. And when if you get it with really high implied volatility, that volatility crush can overtake your directionality. So your directionality could be wrong, but if this volatility really comes out of it and you're directionally wrong, uh, I've showed in some web webinars on the volatility crush that this can actually, you could be in the money on one of your, say, short calls and this rallied up, but volatility came out. You, you could be in the money on your short call and still be, you know, net P&L positive because the vol came out of those premiums so much. So that's why it's really important when you're selling options to make sure that you have high above 50 uh, implied volatility percent. And for those of you that are new, the, the way that the number over here, high implied volatility percent or implied volatility percent above 50 is determined is you take where implied volatility is trading right now Okay, so you have a fraction, you have the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator, you subtract where it's trading now from 
where its low has been in the numerator and then in the denominator you subtract the high from the low and then you divide those by each other that gives you where the percent is how far out in time are you going on the condors and or butterflies uh, great question Raymond I look to enter these strategies when I don't have the uh, theta decay numbers or chart for me but uh, right around 35 days to expiration I want to be is 35 days to expiration is where 50% of your theta comes out of your options strategy or out of your options premiums so I like to get in you know a week before that happens and so right around 45 days let's say 45 some odd days and closest to that 45 days where I really like to put those on uh, with this particular set I did it with the uh, March and the April because they were very close to you know which one was closer to 45 days to expiration were the March or the April and so I just kind of did it in both of them so with two weeks left there's 14 so yeah I think it was around 28 days so you know 28 days to 35 40 days was about as much as uh, the other side of the coin where I was above 50 days so I my target would be if, if it were a perfect world 45 days yes Raymond 45 days and IV above 50 would be the perfect world we don't always have that so I usually default to whichever one is closer does that make sense uh, what minimum open interest great question are you looking for for uh, this big one uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for high implied or high open interest and I want the bid ask to be a little you know tighter than normal uh, being five cents or something along those lines you know I did bend some of the rules with this uh, these strategies to make sure that I got them on but yes somewhere you know on a hundred dollars stock you know I want it to be inside a ten dollar or ten cents and uh, you know five cents would be great and on something you know less than that I'm looking for really inside of 10 cents but the tighter the better because the more legs you add in there the more wiggle room there is and the wider the break uh, the uh, midpoint of that is but if you have a lot of open interest in the underlying in the options chains even if sometimes the bid ask looks a little wide if you see there's a ton of open interest in those there's players out there and we used to call them they're sitting in the weeds this means they're not actively participating but if they saw a bid or an offer come in they might hit it so or tighten it up a little bit so um, you have to always be aware of that that if they um, don't have a lot of open interest then and they have wide bid ask uh, then then you would look see there's a lot of open interest in here it's seven cents wide um, but usually say that's seven cents wide you know you can see that really it's not quite that wide all the time so if you bid these 60h probably you would get a better offer coming in uh, if you see 50 or 100 if you only see 50 or 100 in open interest then I would not play with it if you looked over here and saw 50 you know open interest in these then yeah I would think that with Walmart somebody's going to come in there and, and play okay as long as you see a lot of like big numbers and you know thousands of contracts trading in the ones that are around at the money then you know those there's players in there because there's another side to all of that even though these might have been big guys you know six thousand contracts or something like that there's somebody else that was the other side of it that's looking to trade and tighten that up for you so keep that in mind going forward too um, I think I've caught everybody's questions I thought I saw one that may have gotten missed uh, um, 70 percent of iron uh, somebody asked about 70 percent it scrolled off but 70% of iron condors lose 
Um, if you have a third the width of the strike, your probability of success is 70%. Your probability of loss is 30%. So your probabilities are uh, with you on this. Uh, I don't know what think back is, uh, TJ. Somebody's asking if I can use think back to get uh, a feel for these strategies. For the untested side, would you ever, would you cover the short strike or the whole spread? I cover the whole spread, JV. Um, if it's worthless, I just get out of it. You know, it's a thought to, to leave the, the long on, but um, I don't think that that would really help that much unless you got a really huge move, maybe. Okay, uh, when you defend the iron butterfly, you have to sell two more options with the one call or put at the money. Um, Nick, with the iron butterfly, for instance, let's look at our um, SPY iron butterfly because that's the one that was kind of getting tested on this iron butterfly today uh, that's a different strategy that's short calls uh, that's the uh, butterfly I did today and then I rolled out some short uh, calls that I have in there um, so this is the iron butterfly that I did for the um, webinar so with this particular strategy, I collected a little over $7 for it, $7.15. Okay, so that $7.15 you add to this uh, 193, right? So my break even is right here around uh, the 200 level. Now, the reason why I wouldn't want to start rolling this is because my probabilities are that I'm getting tested on this this strategy. So I know that going into it. Um, now, I would roll when SPY goes above 203. And I would then roll this entire spread down to the 30 delta when it came into line. So, um, sorry, uh, what am I looking for? All right. So trying to think and click at the same time. So that 30 delta is probably going to be somewhere around this 98, 99 once I get that strike passed through. So, um, you know, I'd probably be able to collect another 80 cents or a dollar for that width of that spread. Um, that would add to my overall. So I, you know, only have $2 at risk then. Does that make sense? Going inverted. So right now, this is normal okay so you know when you're short a call you think it's going to go below that number when you're short a put you think it's going to go above that well it's inverted when all of a sudden i'm short a put higher than my call okay that means you've gone inverted which means that you are you know somewhere in no man's land because it can't possibly be right on both sides right here I can be right on both sides if at expiration it's trading right at 93. But as soon as these puts go to 94 or 95, I'm becoming more inverted, which means that, you know, the, there's no real possibility that one of these options isn't going to be in the money. I'm going to have something in the money at expiration no matter what. So that's what I'm talking about, like you're, you're cauterizing the wound, which if you know any, know about cauterizing, when you cauterize, say you get cut, you burn it to to seal off all of those uh, all of those uh, veins in your arm or wherever you got cut, and it is a nasty way to uh, stop the bleeding. But if you're going to bleed to death, you know you might as well take evasive action uh, to stop that bleeding. You know. Um, because you can't really, you're, you're just trying to slow it down a little bit and you know, you're going to, you're kind of locking in a loss there, but it's not going to be as painful as 
if you did nothing. So that means you're going inverted. Kind of like when you get a bloody nose and you just put a tourniquet around your neck. No, not really, but not quite that evasive. But uh, in a sense, you know, you're, you're trying to collect more premium and uh, make that loss, that max loss, a little bit less painful than it was before. Um, is there any way to reverse an inversion profitably? Um, it, you would have to have it land like perfectly. You would have to have your uh, credits, yes and have it land between your short put evenly between your short put and your short or your short put and your short call so if it lands right in there you're probably going to be able to be right around a break even because remember these are going to uh and your puts are going to inflate on you and your calls are going to decrease a little bit but it's a uh, playing around with math that almost never works jb you're really just trying to stop the bleeding on this with the inverted uh, inverted iron butterfly. That's another thing, you know, that's why I try and cover these a lot faster. Like I talked about with the uh, iron butterfly to cover these as soon as you get about a quarter uh, of that premium, because the premium was $7. You know, if I get a quarter of that, that's better than the iron butterfly. If I, you know, get like a, a tenth of that or maybe, you know, 10% or 15% within a few days, then I would definitely go to cover that too, because then you're getting out of it before you're allowing the probabilities to uh, get away from you. Uh, but Raymond, I almost never find the uh, iron butterfly pins at expiration. But again, with this strategy, I'm never taking this strategy to expiration unless it is looking like a full loser. And in that case, it almost never comes back to pin right there. Um, I'm looking to cover this, you know, within one to two weeks. Uh, hope, you know, in a perfect world, it would be one week. But usually it's going to take about 15, 20 days before this kind of all works out of it and the theta comes in. So I'm looking to cover this for, you know, 25% of my max profit. Uh, with an iron butterfly, I'm probably going to be using half the size I would with an iron condor, um, but I'm going to be covering it much quicker. We're looking to cover this as soon as I can. So usually with an iron condor, I'm looking for 50% of max profit. With this, I'm not ever looking to try and collect this full $7.15. I don't like going into expiration on a, it, the last week of expiration on any strategy if it can be avoided. If I have a strategy on in that last week, it's because it's a full loser and I have nothing to lose but to leave it on and, you know, hope that it comes back. Uh, so I'm trying to cover these rather quickly. If it goes to full loser, uh, then I'm that's the only time I'm going to let that go to expiration. Otherwise, I'm looking to manage this or uh, defend it. Did that, did that make sense? Did I answer your question, Raymond? I don't ever look to take anything into expiration. Uh, if you roll the iron fly to 30 delta, yes, you've changed that strategy. And I don't even know what you call it. It's just an in inverted iron butterfly. You're just gone from, you're going to defense mode and trying to collect every nickel you can to, to uh, to save on that loser. With this one, you know, I was tested on my break even today, uh, you know, and if I were to roll that, I'm going inverted, I'm kind of locking in a loss. I also am still bearish on the overall s and P's, so, um, you know, that's why I'm going to hold on to this. It's really hard to defend the iron butterfly unless it goes, you know, really against you. And I wouldn't go and buy um, a, a call or something like that another call that because you're adding more risk to this trade you know if it's uh you don't want to throw good money at bad money and if it's if it's gone bad all you're trying to do is throw some good money at a bad trade and make it less painful on this one especially 
with the uh, iron condor, you know, that's the nice thing about the iron condor is you have so much uh, opportunity to roll it, roll it, roll it. And then all of a sudden you create this uh, iron butterfly with the iron condor. If I've rolled to the iron butterfly, that's when I'm, I'm stopping that. Do I buy back the untested side and then resell them at the 30 Delta? The untested side, uh, yes. And I usually do it all with one click. I would do something like, you know, if I was going to do this, I would go to, you know, sell this. I'm going to buy that. Then I would roll it probably to, you know, like I said, if it goes three more ticks against me, one, two, three, four ticks against me. I'd have to roll it four ticks. One, two, three, four, because that would probably be closer to the 30-ish delta. Um, and I'm probably not going to collect as much of a credit. So, but then oh, I'm still going to do it $10, $10 wide. So uh, I'd sell that one, buy this one. I forgot to hold down the control. Oh, I did it. Do that, and then buy that one in. So I would be buying in the 93s, selling the uh, 183s to get out of those, which I've done down there. And then I would do the uh, 197s and the 187s. So I'd collect another 67 cents for that. So that's how I'm going to, you know, like I said, you're not collecting a whole lot for that. As a matter of fact, for that, I'd probably uh, increase for only getting that amount, probably increase my risk a little bit more there. And go to the 88s. Click the 89 cents. So I'm collecting another 90 cents. Try and collect another 90 cents for that to... Uh, you know, add to my overall net lick. So 89 cents on the, so it, I'd have $2 at risk because I originally collected $7.15. That would give me collecting about $8. So, um, you know, I decreased my risk a little bit and my, own, my risk is now overall $2 because I've collected $8. The width is $10. I've got $2 of risk. But then I would have to have it come down here and try and pin right here between 96 and 95 at expiration. So that's why I don't like doing a whole lot of defense with the iron butterfly unless it's gone really against me. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, can I do the same for the SPY iron fly? How does the analyze tab look uh, on an iron butterfly? Um, yeah, uh, it's going to probably, let's just go into a different month so it looks a little cleaner. I wouldn't usually do this, but the iron butterfly, like I talked about, I'm trying to collect about um, a third the width of the strike. So let's say, um, I'm going to probably go to like the 16 Delta. I usually like to pick the 16 Delta on this. So I would hit sell that. What's that? Why is it not? Oh, okay. So, you know, let's do a $2 wide. So the 81. 81, 19, so this is how I'd build it out, go into the 16 Delta, and um, I'm going to sell the, that looks good, and buy those. So that would be your iron butterfly. So I do, I've done a $2 wide iron condor, collected 59 cents, so that's between my 25% and my 30% uh, uh, width. You know, of course, I'd like to get 60 some cents for it, but that would be that. So then I would, my break even on this, on the call side is when it's trading uh, at uh, $211.59 to the upside, 
Okay, so that's when I would go to roll these puts down or up in the options chain, roll those up and collect some more change for it. Yes, this is a subscription service on this. Is anybody else? Oh, just so you wanted to look at this on the analyze tab. So let's analyze that trade. And it's because uh, it's got my positions in there. I don't want that one. Why isn't it? I don't want anything. I don't know why I didn't analyze it. I messed something up. Uh, uh, what do you mean by taking the third, the width of the strike? So third, the width of the strike would be, so usually, you know, on a, on a call spread, I do the same thing. So I'm trying to get for a dollar wide, a third, the width would be 33 cents, right? Because a third of a dollar is 33 cents. A quarter of a dollar is 25 cents. So I'm trying to get somewhere between 25 and 30 cents for the width. Now with the iron butterfly, if I sold this strike, it's usually around the 16 delta, and then I bought this 11 uh, delta strike. So then I would go down to the 16 deltas here and sell the 181s and then buy 179s because I'm doing $2 wide. So 59 cents. So a third the width or a quarter of the width of the strikes would be 25 cents, right? Or sorry, a, a quarter would be 50 cents. A third would be 66 cents to make it, excuse me, look a little bit cleaner for, let's just do the dollar wide. So I'm gonna sell that, buy that, and then go to the 16 delta again. I'm gonna sell that holding the control button down, 33 cents. So that is a third the width of the strikes. Collected 33 cents, the width of the strikes is a dollar, and I've collected 33 cents. So that's what I mean by collecting a third the width of the strikes. Now when you're rolling it down and you're trying to go to the 30-ish delta, you're basically trying to collect whatever you can. It's not always going to be you know, a third of the width of the strikes. As a matter of fact, if you rolled it down to the 30 delta, you're going to collect usually um, probably right around that again because you're rolling the 30, 30 deltas usually just on one side will give you around a third of the width. So, oops, if I just go to doing that, you know, that's 25, 36 delta usually gives you about a third the width of the strike, somewhere between 25 uh, to 33% uh, the width of the strikes. And that's why I tried, you know, we've started this strategy out at the 16 delta. When it goes bad, then we're rolling to the 36 uh, or 30-ish delta. That's why I talk about 30-ish delta. So that way you can collect another third the width of the strikes. So that's that's the whole idea is to try and, we collected a third the width of the strikes on a dollar wide. We originally collected 30 cents, let's say, and then we roll it because we're tested. You know, it's gone up there and tested us on our break even. We roll again to get another uh, 35 cents, and now we have 60 cents, 65 cents in collected premiums. So we've lowered, or, you know, we've lowered our risk and we've increased our break even by another 30 cents. Does that make sense? Uh, I roll strikes. First step is to roll strikes, not time for me. Um, you know, if you, Trevor, the Trevor's asking, uh, so you roll strikes, not time. Uh, and when do you roll time? Great question. I roll strikes when I'm a little iffy about my directionality thinking. If I think that the directionality of this is um, 
you know, starting to go against me and it's not going to come back, that's usually when I'm going to start rolling strikes. Okay. When I roll time, that's usually, I think I'm still right. I still think the probabilities are going to play out. Then I will roll for time on that type of scenario. Collect some more credit. Always roll for time for a credit. Don't roll for time if you can't get a credit. Big takeaway. Don't ever do it for a debit because then you're adding more risk. Don't do that. Roll for time only if you can collect for credit and you believe that it is going to uh, come back to your strikes and your, uh, you know, your sweet spot. Does that make sense, Trevor? Did I answer your question there? Yeah, uh, JJ, I only did it because it was, I, JJ's asking, I'm looking at the May 77. No, I would never enter this strategy this far out. I like to go for the sweet spot. It would have just, I felt, looked very confusing if I started putting an iron butterfly inside of the, or sorry, an iron condor in and around this iron butterfly just for visual purposes. I thought that that would start looking a little wanky and uh, confuse some people. So that's why I, I just went out further in time, went out to a clean month. I probably should have gone to the April because this is the closer to the, uh, and SPY has plenty of open interest and tighter markets usually during the daytime in these these uh, monthlies you can get uh, penny wide in these monthly. So same idea would have been for here also. I was just looking for a clean month. At what percent loss would you close uh, one leg? Um, not sure what you're asking. What percent loss would I close one leg? I, I usually put this on as a strategy, defend it as a strategy. And because it's a defined risk strategy, um, I'm going to let the probabilities play out and believe that I'm being tested because the probabilities of me being tested are twice as much as me being correct. So knowing that, you know, every time you do an option strategy, it doesn't matter what it is, you can almost guarantee yourself that in the first two or three days that this strategy is going to look like it's a loss on your PL. That's trading because it's always going to be moving around. So just don't look at it as, as you're making or losing money right away. Look at it as you're playing the probabilities. That's the big thing is you're playing the probabilities. You know, great poker players play the probabilities. They know that even if they're losing here uh, on a bad streak or something, the probabilities are going to play out. They just math is math probabilities are probabilities they're going to play out so forget about the money part of it think about your you're playing the probabilities of success on this and you'll be much more successful trading if you always look at everything as a probability of success and what your risk is i usually put on i usually aim to put on these as close to 45 days as possible. I don't always look at the weeklies, but with something like SPY, that there's a ton of open interest, even in the weeklies, I would look at SPY with the weeklies. But for the most part, um, I only really look at the weeklies when I'm rolling strategies out. For instance, I've rolled Twitter, I've short Twitter uh, puts a lot higher and um, I've been rolling those out in time, so uh, I'll roll those through like the weekly. So when I roll, I will look to the weeklies uh, because I want to be able to try and roll it a few times. Does that make sense? Um, you're asking 45 days versus five days. Do you have more time risk? Do you mean five days to expiration, Jacob? Uh, Peter's asking how many times do I defend over the next 15 days before getting out? Usually if I put this strategy on, uh, I'm going to try and defend it if at all possible in the next 15 days. But usually when I put a straight strategy on, um, because it's defined, one of these defined risk strategies, I'm going to let the probabilities play out and I'm either going to take the loss or, or wait for it to come back in my favor.
Yes, 45 days. It, it Well, in a sense, 45 days has more odds of spiking out of the range. But that's why we're trying to do this with high implied volatility, because high implied volatility with that 45 days out, the idea is volatility is going to revert back to the mean, which means we're going to settle down. Volatility is going to come out of those options. So we're going to get that volatility crush, which allows theta to rather quickly come out of these options. When you have high implied volatility, what that does is it it holds off theta from really coming out of these options. So, you know, you could see like a 10 or 15 plus percent theta decay in one day because volatility comes out of it that theta really starts to crush. Um, that's why I like doing the 45 days. Five days to expiration, uh, you have more gamma risk, which means uh, gamma over here starts inflating and that affects your deltas. So your deltas start coming up. So for every dollar move within that last seven days, then you're getting a lot more uh, delta movement and your options are gonna juke back and forth. I don't like playing around in that. That's why I like to try and get out of these as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, I haven't looked at win in a while. I uh, was saying only in stocks they have spike like win. Um, yeah, but see, wind's volatility has really come off since this breakout started happening. So, and usually as markets trend higher, volatility comes out quickly. But, um, you know, wind would have been probably a good one to put on a couple of weeks ago when we had some decent implied volatility, but it must not have had 50% implied volatility when we were looking because I'm sure it would have come up. But we are looking for something that has spiked in volatility like this uh you know did that cover that gap might have i'd have to look at that closer because this might be a time that covered the gap and might start trading sideways might be a time to put on um an iron condor around solar city i think there's spreads have gotten really wide lately that's not going to be a good indicator but spreads on solar city have really kind of Bid ask has gotten really wide lately. Uh, GDX, I don't know. If, um, the gold miners are a great time to get in this because it even looked like G. Uh, everybody's talking about gold's going to the moon now, and usually when everybody's starting to talk about that, you get something like this. I'm a little worried. I had on, I was long gold, and just covered it yesterday a day early, it looks like, because I could have gotten out probably a little higher. But uh, I never looked back at that. I just heard everybody talking about it. It broke this new high. I'm like, I'm getting out. This is just way too quick of a move up that I just didn't want to be in it. So the gold miners, I would be a little bit worried about their downside coming forward. Um, I'm on... TD Ameritrade, toss, think or swim. Uh, yeah, you can go, if somebody's asking about this IV percent, you can go into this uh, customize right here and just type in uh, implied volatility percent and you can add it. And I highly suggest doing that because if you're looking at selling premium, you must, must have high implied volatility. That is the number one rule. Selling strategies have high implied volatility because we're looking for this volatility crush to happen. You do not want it to be expanding on you when you've sold a strategy because you could be directionally right and still lose money. I would rather be directionally wrong and make money than directionally right and lose money. That makes sense. So sell in high implied volatility because you can be wrong and still make some money or uh, at least buys you some time. But when you are getting directionally right and volatility is expanding on you, it's just it's painful because you're like, I am directionally right. And uh, 
and I'm not making money. That's just a horrible feeling. Uh, do you ever leg in iron condors from a high IV side first? Um, Peter, I have uh, done that. And um, I even considered doing that with uh, the GLD, as a matter of fact, because I was short a put spread way down here. I thought about adding a call spread to this. And I've done that when I thought it's just going to kind of trade sideways and I've gotten nice chunky premium out of it and maybe implied volatility didn't go down and it's just not decaying very fast. That's the only time uh, I will add and build an iron condor is when, for instance, I sold and it would usually only happen when you sold a call spread first and then it comes off. But that volatility expands on you. You're directionally right, but nothing's coming out. You're not getting any premium. Uh, coming out of those that call spread because volatility is expanding on you. And if it comes down here, I add a put spread to it because I think it's bottomed out and then wait for that volatility to really come out of it. It's real vol play. Only time it really happens is when you sell a call spread, you're directionally right. Then I might add a put spread to it and wait for volatility to come out and really trading volatility at that point, if that makes sense, because volatility has expanded on me and now I'm trying to add another high volatility play to it. Does that make sense? But that's very rare that I'm going to do that. Usually in a situation like this, as a matter of fact, I covered the call or the put spread yesterday. I was looking at adding a call spread in GLD just because everybody was saying it was a buy. Uh, one more and then I'll try and wrap it up. I don't even think I have this on my, uh, gold corp. Another one, you know, this could want to, you know, I'd have to redo my, uh, Fibonacci levels on this again, because I haven't, I haven't looked at it in forever, but, um, let's see, what is the, uh, IV percent on this? It's 53. So, it, you know, it doesn't really look very good to me because I could see this having a big down move back um, just because, you know, all of the gold things have really rallied hard. So I'm kind of biased on this, but, you know, if if you wanted to do it, I would sell the call spread above here, which is probably what I would just end up doing is selling a call spread against this and then pick your put spread down a little bit lower. But. It fits the parameters. I just don't like the chart set up for it. Yeah, I mean, in this regard, you got, I would think that, but that's my opinion, you know, and my opinion's just that. It's an opinion. So I would probably look to just sell call spread, but I'm a contrarian, you know, it just made a 52 week high. That would be something that all of these longs are itching to cover. In my eyes, that's the way I look at it from a contrarian point of view. We've had a massive rally up in gold. We've had a massive rally up in all these miners just as of recently, you know, GLD. I mean, I look at it as like, you don't think this guy's just dying to cover these guys? You know, they got consolidation. A lot of people started covering here. They got a pop. You probably got some people jumping on board like everybody saying it's going to the moon, and then that's when all the longs cover. And you could see it like the panic to get out because all of these guys now have overhead supply, which means they're long and it's below them and they can't wait to get out. So, um, TJ, you can go to protraderstrategies.com and uh, get these. I've gone over a little bit long, so... Um, let me try and wrap this up a little bit. I want to thank everybody for, you know, doing this on a Friday. But like I said, in the chat box, there is a link to all of these. And if it doesn't give you the strategies you're looking for, TJ, and I've done them on everything from uh, poor man's covered calls, you know, uh, collars, collar replacement, synthetic long, synthetic short, everything. Uh, so you can get all of that sent to you. Uh, but with the premium membership you can 
get the daily market commentaries where I'm talking about everything I'm doing uh, on a daily basis, how I'm defending these strategies when they go against me, uh, wh when and where I see something that I want to put on. Uh, I talk about like adding long deltas and short deltas to my um, my overall portfolio and how I'm trying to keep my bias, whether I'm, you know, you know, bearish or long or uh, bullish. So I talk about all of that stuff in the daily market commentaries. I also talk about all the economic data that comes out or geopolitical stuff. Um, and you get the trading lessons videos, which are these webinars in a sense, but more concise, 10, 15 minutes, more kind of like for review rather than really learning the strategy. Uh, I think you get a lot more out of these uh, webinars because, you know, I can answer your questions live, whereas the, uh, the, options trading videos. I'm just kind of giving you the quick rules, quick and dirty, good for review for the most part. But these we try and drill down on everything and get your, your questions answered. Uh, so uh, we have that offer going on. Uh, and the other thing is in the chat box, you can get that link to all of this stuff. Uh, later webinars, we're going to be drilling out on other option components, how to trade options and trades that I find when and where appropriate, just like I did with the iron condors. I found like six, seven iron condors to do, and I found about uh, five iron butterflies to do. And um, those worked out real good. As a matter of fact, you know, I liked the back and forth because I even took a Netflix trade off of one of uh, the people that were a participant in the webinar last time, and that one's working out rather well. So, uh, you know, I like to have the back and forth because I can go through the steps that way. Also, reach out to us, Pro Trader Strategies, and you know, tell us what you guys want to see a, a webinar on. If I've missed something, or there's a strategy out there that you want me to look at for your type of uh, strategy. And if you have any questions, you can contact us at 310-598-6677, or you can email us at trading at protraderstrategies.com. If you guys have a strategy on that's going against you, want to know what my rules are and how I would defend it, or whether there was a trade that you're looking at and if that would fit with the rules, please reach out to me. I'm more than willing to talk to you about it and want to see you guys succeed. So please reach out and talk to me about that. Uh, uh, there should be, if you're having trouble finding links to the webinars, uh, just give us a call at this number and they can, they can help you out with all that stuff. All right. Appreciate you guys all sticking around a little bit longer on this webinar. I always seem to get a little gabby and go a little over, but I appreciate you guys sticking around on a Friday. Uh, that's all I got for you guys today. If you can't take that. Take it easy. Have a great weekend, you guys. Take care.